Hello and welcome to the fourth video in the quadcopter building for beginners series. Now this isn't the first quadcopter building for beginners series I've done. The very first two quads I ever built on the channel were designed for beginners and they go through each of the individual steps just like this one did. The following five builds have been showcasing individual frames, different flight controllers, different building methods. But in this series, the eighth series on the channel, I'm going back to basics because since those first two series were recorded, an awful lot has changed and in fact quadcopter building now is an awful lot easier than it used to be because of the advances with things like flight controllers, ESCs, motors, frames and everything else. So last time we had a look at things like the flight controller, the motors, props and ESCs that we were going to use. This time we'll look at the rest of the kit and then next time we'll actually start building everything. Now the reason we're taking so much time talking about things like choosing the kits that you're going to use is this is such a fundamental part of any build. Historically a lot of places were offering kits that you could buy that had the motors, ESCs, flight controller, frame and all the bits and bobs to make a quadcopter but these days that's less and less common so it's up to you as a brand new person that's never ever done this before to find all the pieces that are going to work together. And if you make good choices you'll have a great build experience and end up with a model that flies and works well. If you don't make great choices then it could be very tricky to build and also be a bit of a nightmare when you come to fly it as well. So let's talk about FPV gear. Now for those of you that are interested in FPV I have a couple of playlists on the channel. One is called Introduction to FPV and the other one is just called FPV and it's got all of my reviews and pieces in there as well. And FPV is where you wear some goggles stood at the side of the field and you look through the camera that's actually mounted on the model itself. It gives you a first person view. And it's a fantastic way to fly and most quadcopters these days are flown in that way. So we're going to talk about the camera, the FPV video transmitter and also the FPV antenna choices that you should think about when you are going to build a model like this. We'll start with the camera. So the cameras these days are pretty good. If you go with one of the main brands, something like a Foxeer or a Runcam, then pretty much every camera in those lineups will perform easily well enough to give you a good FPV experience. You can expect to pay anything from kind of like 25 to 40 pounds for a camera, and the more you pay, the more features you get. If you want to look at the different cameras, the reviews that I've done, again, check out the FPV camera playlist if they're all in there. But there are a couple of things that you need to consider depending on the frame that you're looking at. FPV cameras always used to come in two sizes. There was the normal HS 1177 size. Uh, that was the initial camera that everyone was using back in the day for FPV. And it's kind of become a standard size. And they also used to be what called board cameras that are no longer really knocking about. These days, you tend to find you have those kind of normal size cameras, full size cameras, micro and mini versions as well. And that means that you don't have to sacrifice everything in terms of quality to put a small camera onto your model, which used to be the case until about 18 months ago. There are lots of other vendors around as well. One of the up and coming ones that I'm starting to think about having a look at here is Cadix. Uh, so those Cadix cameras seem to be getting quite good reviews too. So the nice thing about modern cameras is they tend to support a very wide range of voltages. Back in the day, it used to be either 5 or 12 volts. These days, most modern cameras will run on anything between about 5 to 36 volts, but check the specs of the ones that you're interested in. That means wiring them up becomes very straightforward because any steady solid voltage supply you can use to run your camera. And modern flight controllers and video transmitters have really good voltage regulation so that the power that goes into the camera is very clean. And you'll find on some models that they're covered in capacitors. Those are those little things that look like little microscopic Coca-Cola cans. And they will be all over the thing in an attempt to try and reduce interference in the FPV feed. Now you'll notice that in a lot of my videos I don't have those problems and that's again because I'm taking my time and trying to make sure that any voltage that I supply to the FPV equipment is going to be as clean as it possibly can. So do keep that in all in mind and we'll cover it when we get into the build piece. Other things to consider when you're getting a camera, think about field of view. Field of view is how wide it can see to each side. I tend to find that for me about 130 to 140 degrees field of view is great. 
some cameras come with different lenses that change that field of view and some cameras are better at things like low light than others but again if you're interested in the cameras go and have a look at my fpv camera playlist and you can pick one but i would say if you're going to go for any of the foxier or run cams you're going to be nice and safe for a new build Next one we'll talk about then is the FPV transmitter. Now this is the piece of technology on the quadcopter that's going to take the video from the camera and the flight controller and then send it to your goggles or screen or whatever you're using to view the image. Now the reason I say that the information is going to come from the flight controller rather than just plug the camera in is that modern flight controllers these days are quite clever and they have an on-screen display built into them so what happens is you plug the flight controller into the camera and the video signal from the camera comes into the flight controller and then the flight controller overlays whatever information you want whether it's battery voltage altitude current that's been run the flight mode that you're using artificial horizon whatever it is it overlays that on the image and then pops that image out the back and that's what goes into the FPV transmitter to be sent down to your goggles. Now again, there's tons of choice for video transmitters. Everyone has their own particular favourites, but now there's started to be more and more coming out that support either something called Smart Audio, which is a Team Black Sheep thing, or Tramp, which is an Immersion RC thing. Although those developed by those two companies, they're starting to crop up in lots of other places as they're licensed. Now that is a really smart way that you can change all the settings on your video transmitter via the on-screen display via an inbuilt menu. And that's a really cool feature that allows you to set everything how you want it to be. And I like that because it means then you don't have to remember what combination of button presses or what those flashing LEDs on top of the video transmitter mean. And sometimes the video transmitter is hidden away in the middle of the model. And in this case, we're going to do the same here. So you can't always get to the little button or whatever it is you need to press to change the channel if you're flying with a friend and you both turn up with your model set to exactly the same band and channel. So if you tried to fly like that, then both the signals would be competing with each other and you wouldn't see either of them properly. This time we're going to be using this product from Holibro. Again, it's another video transmitter. It's actually designed to sit on top of the stack. Unfortunately, there won't be enough room in this particular frame that we're using to mount them all one on top of the other but there's loads of room behind the flight stack where I can pop this and it can work great. It will allow me to change the power settings, band, frequency, channel, all that goodness through the on-screen display and it will provide a lovely clean voltage out to the camera so we don't get any of that nasty interference too. Last thing to talk about is the FPV antenna. Most of this kit, when you buy it, doesn't come with any kind of FPV antenna, or if it does, it's worth everything you paid for it, i.e. nothing. There are some very high performance antennas that cost an awful lot of money. And I've got some of them here and they work fantastically well. But the really cool thing with Pagoda antennas is they're actually made of elements that are part of little PCB boards. So getting the antennas and the elements aligned perfectly is an awful lot easier and they work spectacularly well. I like the Menace RC stuff here. I have an awful lot of it. It's, it's on the majority of my kit. Just make sure that it has the same connector as the video transmitter that you're buying and you're looking for whether it is an RPSMA or an SMA type. If you're interested to know how far you can fly, there's also quite a cool tool on the Menace RC website. If you put in there the power setting of the video transmitter that you're going to use, the Menace RC antennas, it will give you an idea of how far away you can fly. And that's a fun thing to play with and change everything. Next thing we need to think about then is if you haven't already got a radio is what kind of radio should you get for your first build. The thing with radios is they are like goggles and battery chargers. They're an investment in the hobby and you're better getting a really high quality set so that they will last you for many years. Now when people ask me about what radio should I get, the main ones that I tend to recommend are things like the QX7, the X-Lite and the Tyrannus radios from FR Sky, also called Free Sky. They run something called OpenTX, which can be a little bit overwhelming and complicated for some, but in terms of a radio that can do pretty much everything, these are the ones. Whenever you're looking for a radio, I would personally try and get one that friends or family might have or ones that have lots of videos and set up bits and pieces on YouTube if you haven't got somebody around you that already has the radio that can give you a hand setting it up. 
Fly Sky radios are very good as well. They tend to be pretty inexpensive these days. They're very nicely put together and offer all of the basic functions that the majority of pilots are going to need. The other radios that I quite like are the multi-protocol radios. Now these are the ones that we've looked at recently, now starting to be available in lots of different form factors, and they are really cheap and cheerful, usually starting to come now with some kind of little receiver in the box, have the same ability to have lots of different model memories as the other things we've already talked about, but also allow you to connect up to some of the little indoor flying quadcopters as well. So if you're practicing or you want to get that muscle memory on a radio with the indoor quadcopter you've been practicing with before you move on and try and fly this one that you're going to build, it's a great way to do it because the multi-protocol radio should talk to pretty much everything. There are lots of other options around as well, Spectrum, Futaba, but they tend to be quite expensive in comparison. Things like the Turn G Evolution are very nice. I did a whole video talking about what to consider when you want to buy a radio. Have a look in there. But for me, if you're going to buy a radio, I would probably say get something like a QX7 and then invest a bit of time watching some of the setup videos on YouTube. I have some here and it will be a radio that will last you for years and years and years and it's less than £100. Next thing to talk about then is the receiver. The receiver is the little bit of technology that goes into the quadcopter that listens to the radio. So the radio with moving the sticks and switches is how you tell the model how you want to fly. And the receiver, of course, then is going to listen to that radio and then transform those signals into something the flight controller can understand. Now, I would always use SBUS these days to connect the radio receiver that's in the model into the flight controller so the flight controller knows what you want to do. S-Bus just requires three little cables to be soldered up or connected, so it's a piece of cake to do. It'll support up to 16 channels and is nice and quick. There's lots of other options to connect up. There's something called iBus, with it, which is FlySky's version of S-Bus, but I would say whenever you can, try and go for S-Bus. That's what we're going to do here. I'm going to use one of my QX7 radios, so I'm going to use what I'm talking about, and I'm going to use one of the really small receivers from FR Sky, something probably like an XM Plus that's going to fit nicely into the model and not add a lot of weight. So now we have an idea of what camera we're going to use. We've got a video transmitter and we've also figured out what radio we want to. Now we've got all these nice choices, we can finally get the soldering iron out and everything else and start talking about putting this quadcopter together. So join me in the next video where we'll look at putting the power system of this model together and we'll actually start building. And as I go through each of the steps, I'll give you the tips and tricks from all my years of quadcopter building. If you found that video useful or like the content, then please hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you want to go the extra step, you can become a Patreon of the Painless360 channel and help provide support for what I do here. All the videos created here are put into playlists, so if you're interested in a particular topic, have a look at the playlist, and they all are organised in there to make them easier to use. If you're not sure if there's a video for your particular problem or topic you want to know more about, then add Painless360 to the Google search term that you're interested in, and that should find the video, article, or content about the particular thing that you're interested in having a look at.